Fred McNew, and you're watching QAC TV 7. And it's that time again. I've got the dynamic duo, the Cheech and the Chong, the Laurel and Hardy of Ken Island, my good friend Nick Hoxer. Nick, good to see you good again. To see you, my and of course, my good friend Bill Denny here. Good to see you, old buddy. And while Bill's here, he's having dreams of Mrs. Cole, and the man will be in heaven, okay? Oh. You'll never live it down, Bill. You'll never live it down. Ever that I found myself. Okay. Hey, now, uh, Bill, help me out. Uh, we're down here at the beautiful Ken Island, okay? And over my shoulder is this gorgeous looking bell. And you're gonna, and we, last time we were here, we talked about it, but we didn't know a lot about it. And uh, where we're standing now, let me make sure, I'm gonna get to you in a second, Bill, but uh, Bill, where we're standing now, this was a parking lot. Exactly. This is a parking lot, and we actually used to come in here and park up and look over the bank, and we could see all the cars getting on the ferry and so forth and so on. And also, it was very nice to show your girl the beautiful, beautiful scenery. water out here, the beautiful sand beach, and the beautiful area where the boats came in. And we were uptown because it didn't really cost us anything, but the view was worth a million bucks. And it's still worth it. It's just gorgeous, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And Nick and I were poor, didn't have any money, so we'd bring them down here, and they thought they'd been to heaven. Anyway, good old Ken Isle, she's still here, and here's the famous Liberty Bell. Now, now Bill, help us out. Now, like I said, we were here before, and when I say here, at Mattapique Clubhouse, when everyone knows what we're talking about, we're about 100 yards from the water, right? About 200 yards from the ferry spots? Yeah. Okay, so we're, you know, that gives everybody an idea of where we are. Now, tell me about this gorgeous, and I, I know you've done some homework, tell me about the gorgeous bell over my right shoulder. Well, it's kind of a miracle. Um, I have a lady down uh, in Chester who sells my books, thank the Lord. And a gentleman walked in one day and wanted to buy my book, my new book. And he said, uh, she said, do you know anything about the bill uh, at Mattapique? Oh, yeah, he said, I, I know about it. And he proceeded to tell her what he knew. And he said, uh, I'd like to talk to Nick about it. And uh, she said, well, when he comes in, I'll tell him. Well, I went in several times and I missed him, but anyway, to make a long story short, I'm sitting home one Saturday evening and he called me and he said, Nick, Jimmy Tolson. I said, oh my Lord. Now, is Jimmy a local? Yes, he's a local. His father had a farm down in the lower part of Kent Island here. His name was Wrightson Tolson and Jimmy's um, brother, Wrightson Jr., was a uh, a World War II vet, and he was okay. he was crippled, paralyzed. A lot of Tolsons in the county. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Especially, yeah. especially the Ken Island. They had their, their Tolsons down here. And um, Nick, his name was Edmund Tolson. Excuse me. The father's name was Edmund Tolson. Mm -hmm. Billy just corrected me. Thank you, Bill. That will not be the first time he corrects you. Today. Oh, he corrects <laughs> me continuously. He and Melvin Clark. Melvin's gone. But anyway, uh, he told me the story of the bell. And then uh, this is amazing. For the last 20 or longer years, we've been trying to find out the purpose of this bell. And no one, including Melvin Clark, who knew everything, knew what the bell was doing here. When I worked on the ferries back in the 48, 49, and early 50, 50s, um, the bell sat here. The clubhouse, just, uh, like the, it is now sets, just as it sets now, the clubhouse at that time was the maintenance building. Mr. Uh, uh, Harry Hopkins ran this. A lot of locals worked here. Uh, if we needed uniforms for the ferry, that's where they were. If we needed paint, uh, any anything that we needed, Mr. Uh, had right in here. Yeah, well, yeah they, had, they had right in here. And it's, it's today the very same building, rebuilt by the county, uh, except the wing on the end there, there's another porch, and that was to be done, but somewhere along the line, it, it no never lost, happened. No it, I pray it will happen. But anyway, to get back to the bell, I want... You can blame that on Wheeler Baker. Wheeler Baker. <laughs> Remember, Wheeler's watching this show. Be careful. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, Jimmy said, let me tell you a little story. He said, last summer... I was at Mattapique just looking around what used to be. Last summer, meaning 2014. Mm-hmm. And he said, uh, I'm standing there admiring the bell, not knowing the purpose, and 
this gentleman walked up to me, an older gentleman, and he said, I see you admiring this bell. Do you know the story of the bell? And he said, no, sir, I really don't. He said, are you a local? I said, born and raised here, but I do not know the what story the of the bell. And he said, Nick Hoxer, in his four books, he doesn't know what they were. He said, uh, well, let me tell you a story. He said, back in the 30s, before they had the ferries running every hour, they had, the restaurant was open, the clubhouse. Right to, right to our left here. And okay. people would come up here and have lunch, and they'd go down to the beach, and when it was time to go back to their car to go on the ferry, at 10 minutes before the ferry left, they would ring this big bell. Oh, right here, okay. And he said, uh, I got the fee, the sum of 10 cents a day for ringing this bell. Ring the bell. So when Jimmy called me, he said, I can't wait to tell you because you're not, not going to believe this story. But anyway, we're looking at this bell, and it says M.C. Shane Foundry, right. Baltimore, Maryland, 1900. So the, I'm sure the bell was brought here for this one purpose because there was. we always had assumed that they would ring this bell in the fog. Because sound, oh yes, the sound travels, you know. But we were wrong on that because we did find out that um, just before the ferries um, boarded cars, they would blow their whistle, indicating that they open the gates and let the cars yeah, on. on and then just prior to pulling away from the pier for safety's sake, they'd always give a blast on the like horn, meaning we are leaving. Okay. And then a guard was there to make sure that nobody walked on that, that pier. So that is the story, amazing as it may sound, of why this bell was put here. Do we think, now, did we have fairies in 1900? Uh, when were the fairies that started? About 1919. Okay, so but, but they didn't start here until 1930. 1919, okay. it ran from Annapolis down to Claiborne. Okay. But this, the ferry didn't start here until 1930, and it didn't have sufficient boats, really, to carry the, the traffic. So in 1936, 37, 38, they had the Harry W. Nice, which was a very modern boat, but only a single engine, built in Baltimore. And in my books, you'll find pictures of her be, actually being launched. And so in 1938, when she came on service, people stopped coming up here because they didn't have to wait an hour for the ferries to come in because okay. they were running they were running a regular service so that's the story of the bell and so the bell would ring 10 minutes before 10 minutes prior this kid 10 yeah. cents a day to just the ding did not how many times would he have done it a day oh i mean from six in the morning to six, oh yeah six in the morning until six at night at okay. time and the ferries used to run from um like six in the morning until nine at night and then everything closed up well, in the 40s, after the boys all came back, and this, this, this ferry system was a godsend. All these veterans coming back had no work. And when they expanded the ferry system and, and worked from, uh, they ran from 5 in the morning until 1.30 at night. They tied up at 1.30, and the, ma the maintenance crew in, in the oilers and the engine room, they had time to put fresh water on, put engines, service the engines, whatever was required. And... Uh, as I said, these boys coming back worked as toll collectors. They went and got their license to be engineers. One of me became a captain here, and we were so proud of him. Yeah, a local yokel. Had, you know, he had enough sense to become a captain, so we thought it was amazing. I'm going to give this back to Mike. Well, we're, we're, uh, we're in good shape. Yeah. Yep. What, what, was, what did they run? What intervals? Was it ever half hour? Or? Every 30 minutes. Every half hour. Every half an hour. I, I thought that's what it was. I, I've always but wanted... It was pretty yeah. convenient back there then, you know. So am I, uh, do I assume that it took 30 minutes to cross the bay? 30 minutes, yeah. And in 1948, they built... This is after World War built, II. Yes, they built the um, uh, Governor O'Connor. As a third boat? Uh, she became the fourth boat. Fourth cause, boat. Yes, because in, in 50, they bought they purchased a small boat called the... Uh, well, they, they named it Easter. It was named the Eastern Bay, and then they they honored it to in, in 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 memory or in honor of the chairman of the ferries, and they called it to be Frank Sherman. Okay. But she okay. only carried about thirty cars. Mm. All right. So now the others carried how many cars? 
I'd say the nice carried about 60, and the O'Connor probably carried about 65. Right, that's a pretty big load, yeah. isn't it? 65 oh, yeah, cars. It yeah. is. It is. It's a big load. So this, so this spot, parking lot, and the bell came at about 1930, mm -hmm. is what we're saying. I wonder where it was. No, it, was it, it was about, yeah, yeah in the early 30s. Right, you're absolutely okay. right. You're now, right, we, right. we can tell from the bell it was made in 1900. It'd be interesting to know where it was, where it was hiding for 30 years, right? Because mm -hmm. it must have been made. Yes. Nancy Scarosi of the Parks and Rec okay. said she found it down here. Oh, actually found it? DNR. Uh, and she asked what it was doing there. It's supposed to be up, up here because the record showed he had one. So they finally said, okay, you can have it. So they brought it up here. Okay. And in 2009, when they had a dedication, Melvin Clark and I rang that bell for the first time. And uh, and it didn't crack. Didn't crack. No. Okay. No. And you woke some people up. Oh, I'm sure we did. Okay. Now, Bill. Uh, go, excuse yeah, me. No, go go. Nick. Yes, sir. When, uh, like you say, 1900. It was built in 1900. Where was it before? No, it came Bill, here? I, I, I do not know that. The gentleman uh, didn't. Had, you know, you were talking about the only Ferris. Well, you know, at uh, Love Point, we had uh, uh, Pennsylvania, the Smoky oh, yeah. Joe. And it ran and carried people over to Light Street. Yeah. So we did have transportation from here to Light Street. That's true. And, of course, that ferry carried a lot of produce for the farmers, like tomatoes and wheat and stuff like that. And uh, that was a big help to the farmers on the Island because they had no way to get their get produce. Bill, how Baltimore long was City. the trip to Baltimore? Same thing, 30 minutes? It should have been longer, right? Or not? No, and, uh <laughs> The love point, I think it took at least an hour oh, and a quarter. And 20 minutes. Yeah. Two hours and 20. So ac go. right across the bay here, four miles, was a 30 yeah, minute trip. It went to Light Street. Okay. It came in Light Street. Right downtown. Mm -hmm. So you were right in Baltimore, where this one went to the Naval Academy at first. Yeah, then that's later, right. George Street. Yeah. And then later to Sandy Point. Okay. Which is, yeah. All right. You know, where the bridge hits now. Now, uh, excuse my ignorance, but after World War II, do we still have ferry service to Baltimore? Oh, yes, into 47. Oh, into for we stopped at, at 47. Into 47, yes. Okay. That was the Pennsylvania Railroad. The, the, the passenger trains ran up there until 1937 or 38. Okay. Then they stopped, but they still brought freight and took wheat back, whatever the farmers did, until uh, 1950. When the bridge, around when the bridge came up in 52? Uh, they, they kept it there because when Langenfelder was building Route 50, they needed right. the cement. And they had a plant at the Narrows, and we, they, I was working for the railroad at the time, and they would bring dozens of cars in at the time and make the cement for the road. Okay. So the road from, from the Bay Bridge all the way to the other side of Queenstown. Langenfelders did that? Langenfelders okay. did all of that. A local company which is still hanging on a bit. I want to tell you a little story. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I right. want to tell you a little story about uh -huh. how honored we were. Yeah. In the summertime, uh, produce trucks came on here, uh, cantaloupe, watermelon, tomatoes. We always parked them near the galley door. Uh-oh. I can see what's going to happen here. And we'd invite the, be sure the truck drivers came upstairs, and we got a sandwich or a hot dog, Cokes. In the meantime, we were getting enough cantaloupe and watermelon <laughs> and tomatoes to last us for a week. <laughs> the raid was so in the, in the summertime, we were never without the best produce in the world down in that fresh. galley. And, and locally... For up, up until probably 1950, uh, the local uh, stores in Stevensville brought the food to the ferry for the for the. We got three meals a day. Okay. And this is the crew now. The crew that's the crew. Oh yeah, and we had the best steaks you can ever imagine, oh, can imagine. The best crab cakes you can imagine. We had everything. Then in 1950, the state got smart and hard to dietitian. Oh, Lord, you went back to cucumber sandwiches or something. <laughs> Turkey and cheese. Yeah, just about that, yeah. All we were furious about you that. You had some ladies there that were cooks on the various. Oh, yeah, from... For you all. Oh, yeah, they were up from Lots in Stevensville. Mm. Yeah, the local people, this was their... This is work. Yeah, this, this was work. it. This was it, yeah. But they took care of their crew just like their own stuff. Oh, they did. Okay. They did. It was old-fashioned. It was like schools, and they used to have school lunches you cooked by moms and dads. Yeah. You came in late, which I know those guys did, and they'd have them breakfast, and then they'd go to bed, and then the next morning they'd get up and go into work. But these maids and different ones would wait on them just like they were their own sons. Okay. It's what we talk about off air. There were different times. People treated, everyone knew everybody. 
And it was a part of a family, right? It was a big family, yeah, right? It was it. Now, guys, I want to switch gears just a little bit. It's October 21st, beautiful 70 degrees day. My granddaughter asked me to ask you this question Was there a trick or treat when you were growing up? And if there was, what do we do on Ken Island for uh, trick or treat? Trick or treat. Well, uh, it was, so we're talking 30s and 40s, am I yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Well, every year before Halloween, my mother would take me to Baltimore or even Salisbury or someplace, a bigger city, and I'd pick out what I wanted. One year I picked. Now, does this mean a costume? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Pick out my little costume. I remember way back there, I loved ducks. So what did I pick out? I picked out Donald Duck. I okay. had a little bill and little feathers come out of my tail, and I wasn't much bigger than a duck. Okay. But I went around and quack, 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 quack. Yeah, I quacked all the time. Now, same things, thing, so. paper bag and goodies, or what? Yeah, I had a little bag there. It probably had a little Halloween written on it or something. But when I got home, it would take me 10 days at <laughs> least just to sort all the candy and then I had a lot of friends, and they'd all come in to see me, so you know what happened to the candy. It went quickly. Now, it, it came in easy, and it went out easy. Now, uh, same candy, the old corn, I mean, what did you have, anything different? Yeah, there? well, we had a lot of suckers, okay. and a lot of little uh, teeny taffy bars, and, of course, they came out with, they didn't have the little, like, uh, Milky Ways and all, like they do now. I think the Milky Ways were actually bigger back there then, so it took you a little while to eat the bigger bars of candy, but you always had the eggs and different things that okay. you could eat in, you know, so real same, quickly. So uh, basically same procedure, some type same of costume, procedure. walked around door to door. And everyone, no matter what home you went to, they'd bring you in and try to guess who you were. Okay. Made a little game out of it. They made a game out of it, and of course the idea was not to say anything, but then they would look at your feet, and a lot of kids wore the same, same shoes. shoes. They didn't see your face, but they saw your feet, and they could tell by your feet okay. who you were. Donald Duck with uh, yeah. Bill's shoes on, with right? my shoes okay. on. And they'd guess old Billy every time, you know. So I caught on to that later, and I used to change my shoes. But at first, they were guessing me so easily. I said, how in the heck did they know who I am? Got a false face and all this thing, but they were looking at my feet, and, he, and they could tell and by that's my Bill feet. Denny with his, yeah, with his shoes on. With his little money shoes. Nick, how about you and trick or treat when you're growing up? Basically the same. Okay. Yeah, well, he and I would go out even when we were married, and we would go into Stevensville and dress the up. The teenagers do. I remember one of the shows you're talking about putting soap on windows. Well, oh, that was him. He was on. I was a little what? I was. I mean, I teenage. I don't know who that guy was, but eventually he got caught, <laughs> and I think he ended up. Off of Ken Island, they shipped him away. <laughs> okay. And no his more name windows. Was probably Bill Denny. No more windows. <laughs> Came back later on. Uh, but it mean the same thing. You remember a costume? Yeah. Remember? Oh yeah. No yeah. special costume. No, yeah. no, no. Only Bill with the duck hair. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the bell made in 1900 shows up here in the 1930s. Was used as a signal. Hey, last call. Get on the boat. Okay. Anything else you want to share with us yeah, today? I'd like, to, I'd like to show you. Yeah. you I'm going to show this. But this is the, the ferries after they were sold, after, okay. the, after they stopped running. So this is and they 50, were tied up here. 50s. And my dad was the last employee. Every, every five days a week, he'd come down and start each engine. Okay. And he did that until they were sold. And that, they didn't and leave was, dock at all? When I did my, before I did my last book, this uh, group asked me in Easton, would I come down and make a speech about... Kent Island sure. in the old days. Well, that's like lighting far, you know. Of course, yes, of course, that, he'll, come yeah. of course he'll come So down. I went down, they introduced this lady, and they said uh, her father was a captain on the ferries. I said, mm mm. No, I knew everybody there, every captain. And uh, I had the pleasure of working for most of them. And they gave me her name, and I said, oh my goodness. Frank Sherman, your father was chairman. He's a big boss. He was the wheel. She brought out pictures which no one could identify. She said, my daddy was a good man, took pictures, stories. He never put a name on the back. Hmm. Lo and behold, you knew him, I right? could I identified every captain, every first mate that she brought out. And she said, we've got to get together. And, and so about it took me about three or four months, and we met. My wife went with me. She lived down in and London. And you'd label Derry. all the pictures. And she said, well, for your being so nice, 
pick out the pictures you want yeah. and I'll have them copies made for you. Wow. In my last book, it is you the most fantastic collection of pictures of the old ferry and the people that worked there. Of course, this one, this one now, a walk back in time, has a lot of the employees. But this lady was a was a godsend. She had so she much. She had all info. these pictures and boxes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When we when we dedicated this bell in 2009, uh, no one knew. We couldn't find anyone that knew the history of the bell while well, it was here. And as I said a little while ago, uh, a kind gentleman was here one day. He met a local, Jimmy Tolson, and he said, I'll see you tomorrow in the bell. Do you know where it came from and why it's here? And he proceeded to tell him that when he was a younger man, he got 10 cents a day to ring the bell 10 minutes before the ferries would board. So in all these years, no one has known what this bell was for. And it was made in 1900. Where it was prior to that, we don't know. But uh, Nancy Scarosi, who was with the uh, Parks and Rec, found it down. She told me she found it down to uh, DNR, and she asked for it. They gave it to her. Melvin and I rang it in 2009 when we had the dedication, and it's here where it belongs.